I lived in a time in which things like Father Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver weren't as far from the world as they seem to be today. Um, there weren't as many choices. It was an easier kind of world to live in. And for that reason, I d didn't even think about the choices that were there. Um, didn't spend much time worrying about issues in the 50s of drugs and sex and um, the whole host of lifestyle issues. There weren't lifestyles. We didn't have lifestyles. You just went to school and you did the other kinds of things that were required and part of life. And don't ever remember thinking about those kinds of things. I lived on the kind of block where there were very large dreams. It was a working class neighborhood in which very few of the parents had been to high school, let alone college, or had completed high school, let alone college. And the American dream was guaranteed so that we all knew it was a covenant, an article of faith, that the kids who grew up on that block would, if they went to school and worked hard, do much better than their parents. And that's exactly what happened. As I think about my friends, uh, Jimmy and uh, Barry are teachers, Debbie's a nurse, Marvin and Eddie are doctors, um, Stephen's a Wall Street investor. It was simply something we all knew. It was guaranteed. The American dream was alive on my block. What was the American dream? There weren't details to it. It was just the promise of a better life. One of the fascinating things that occurred to me is realizing that I never, ever remember talking about with friends, should we go to college? Never. Somehow we just ended up in college. It was sort of like a magnet needle pointing north. Um, it always does. No questions, um, no discussion. It just happens. Sun rises every morning, you go to school. You go to college, and your life is better. I want you to describe to me what happens when you, not the first day there, but the activism, the feeling, what you see. The first day there is real important. I remember arriving at college, and the worst part was my parents left. And there I was sitting in this room with two people I'd never met before. And one was a fellow from Pittsburgh who came in with a full year of college credits. The other one was a fellow from Massachusetts, which is where I was going to college, who had this whole social life and was heading off to go drinking, while the other fellow was wandering around trying to find out what a gut course was, or which courses were guts, and I had no idea what the word meant, and <clears throat> didn't want to let on that I didn't have any idea what the word meant. And so they both headed off, and there I was sitting in my room, and it was pouring. And next door, there were two guys playing a record by a group called The Mother's Invention. And, the, and what it was was Susie Cream Cheese. Or I guess it was The Fugs, and it was called Susie Cream Cheese. And what it was was it's um, an oral account of sexual intercourse, screaming next door. And here I am, this naive kid, and I have no idea what all this noise is. There's an upperclassman next door with a whip who's banging it on the floor as hard as he can. And then there's this guy who is obviously, um, I'd never met anybody who used drugs, who was obviously on drugs, uh, writing on a table outside my room. Now, when I say writing on a table, I don't mean writing on a piece of paper or on a table. I mean, this guy's writing on a table. And I sat there in the rain listening to this, thinking, my life has just ended. And I thought, I better write somebody a letter. And I wrote, here I am at college, and this is wonderful. Um, I'm just loving being here, thinking, I hope I can make it through the week. <laughs> and that was my initial experience in college. What young people don't seem to get is, did you really believe you could change things? And what gave students the sense that they could make all this change and do all these things? What gave them this sense of personal power that they could do this? And what was it they thought they could do? You thought you could do. Kids thought they could do. College kids. The whole world was changing when we were in college. Um, by the time I arrived, we'd had John Kennedy telling the nation, Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. After him, there was Lyndon Johnson who promised America a great society. Money was pouring in. We saw people beginning to vote in parts of the country in which they could never vote before. There was a sense that anything was possible. Anything could happen. We were in the heels of a revolution. And that didn't mean a disruptive revolution, but the notion of making for a better society. Um, everybody was talking about a better society. We were watching federal programs pour out like crazy. So that he was a generation, 
my generation, my friends and I, who really believed we were going to live in a time in which the conditions that we saw as troubling would disappear. We could make them disappear. We were a generation, I think, that probably had three things. We had a real sense of hope. We had a real sense of responsibility and a real sense of efficacy that what we did mattered. And I think that sense of mattering came from a world in which some very large heroes walked. There were people, not only John Kennedy, but there were people like Martin Luther King. There were people like Robert Kennedy. And you watched them make a difference and realize you could too. Maybe you couldn't do it on a national scale. Maybe you couldn't do it alone, but the whole generation together could make it happen. And that was awfully, awfully exciting. So that this dream, this dream of idealism was very, very powerful. On one level, when I walk down the street now, I see kids who have purple hair, who have spiked hairdos, who seem to wear in clothes that are real unappealing. And I say to myself, God, I hope my daughter will never do stuff like that. Of course she will. I think every generation does that. Um, it's a way a generation builds a sense of a we-ness. And I think that's probably a real common thing. It happened in the 50s, it happened in the 40s, it happened in the 30s. Every generation just looks different. I think what's striking about the, what we did was that it was such a quick departure and such a radical departure to watch men with hair down to the middle of their backs, um, to watch women with the same hair length, to watch everybody in jeans. Suddenly jeans were a uniform as opposed to work clothes. So that a piece of it, I think, was rebellion, which is we were going to be different. A piece of it embodied the idealism of the era, which is to say it was students in solidarity with workers and people of all stripes, um, the poor, um, those who were feeling the pain of our society the hardest. And so we wore similar kinds of clothes. I think it was also a group saying that the differences that have divided others class issues, uh, race issues, are going to disappear for us because we're going to wear a certain set of clothings. The other kinds of behaviors were a society inventing new social rules. Right? What are the sexual rules? What are the substances that people are allowed to use? Um, saying that this is going to be a more open society in which anything goes. We're going to let a thousand flowers bloom, hundred flowers bloom, lots of flowers bloom. and this kind of a regalia and these kinds of behaviors are going to be the way we show what we care about. So yeah, it wasn't only rebellion, it was more than that. Think specifically of some phrases. In fact, let me, let me read you a few. I've got a few here that I kind of like. The search for self. Everything seemed to be involved with the self. Find myself. Who am I? Oh boy, did I find lots of things in that search. I kept finding new me's every month. Um, I remember periodically my life just falling apart as I had uh, what we then called identity crises, not being able to figure out who I am. The world was changing so fast and had to keep asking yourself, who are you and what do you want to do and what are you about and what's important? And the stimuli out there were so many. There were so many things to try and to do that every time I tried one, I began to ask myself, gee, who am I? What am I about? And I remember going through some severe depressions trying to figure out the answer to that question. Sometimes I thought I had it. And indeed I did, sometimes for hours or days. I remember one day sitting on a beach, talking to friends when I realized, I understand it all. I comprehend the whole world and it's working. Uh, that lasted for several days uh, before I realized, you don't understand any of it. Um, you don't understand, don't have the, le the least clue. So it was, a, it was a time of just incredible ups and downs as I tried to figure out who I was. I remember a lot of people putting down science, math, technology, and we seem to still be paying the price of that today. But I want you to talk about the anti-intellectual part. The word that was used to describe education in the 60s was irrelevant. There was a sense that um, it had nothing to do with what was going on. It was a time in which we were tearing things apart. I remember sitting on the Educational Policy Committee while I was in college. And each week we came in with an explanation of why some requirement had to be eliminated or some course had to be dropped. The nature of the times called for adding much more relevant subject matter. So we saw the, the rise of black studies departments, urban studies departments. Um, it was a time which grades were thought of as 
something that encourages competition among people and destructive of people so that we did all we could to subvert the grading system. There are faculty members who just give A's in some courses and students would flock to those courses. So we went through a period of what was called grade inflation as grades just went sky high. The year I graduated from college, a majority of students graduating from Harvard graduated with honors. Uh, same thing was true of my institution, which was Brandeis. Um, there were there were marvelous experiences. I remember um, grades in one course were decided on the basis of a volleyball game. The team that won got A's and the team that lost got A minuses. Um, there was a sense that what the, exper the experiences we were going to get were much more likely to come, the important experiences, were much more likely to occur from participating in what was going on. So that demonstrations seemed much more important than courses. And the notion was that we ought to let a hundred flowers bloom. You do your thing, I do my thing. Everybody had a poster on the wall. Um, I remember almost every room you went into around the country. You'd find this, and it showed two people holding hands walking down a beach, and it said, you do your thing, I do my thing, and perhaps we can get together, and if we do, it's groovy, or some such. It was a Fritz Perls quote. That really captured the academic mentality. At the same time, there were people who were very serious about this kind of stuff. There were faculty members who chose to give their lives to the study of uh, the search for truth, dissemination of truth. And here's a generation saying, hey, one truth is good as another truth. My truth is good as your truth. Um, that was terribly, terribly um, awful, awful time for those people. It was also a time in which um, authority was under attack. So that meant the authority of the professor was as good as the authority of the student. And the administrator had no authority at all. The consequence was that there was a sense of disruption, alienation, on the part of lots of people at the university who wanted a much more serious academic world and had lived through a much more serious academic world. What is the worst or best thing that you did, looked at from the present? Some of the worst moments I remember are times in which the world caved in. I was deeply affected by the death of John Kennedy, but the death of Robert Kennedy and the death of Martin Luther King tore my world apart. Um, it was hard to believe that people who stood for those kinds of things, people who I really admired, heroes, could fall like that. And I guess my worst moments were times in which I lost faith entirely. And I remember I and a few friends calling strikes and closing down the school, pressing a university for values that are inimical to what it was doing and believing in those strongly, being so sure that I was right and the university had failed in its mission to society that if a generation like mine had stayed at the university for any length of time and pressed for the kinds of things we were pressing for, we would have destroyed the university. And I guess in retrospect that seems like one of the lowest moments. It was also one of the highest. We were incredibly giddy and here you are running a university or essentially dictating terms to a university. 1968 is one of the most important years of my life. Robert Kennedy, for me, was the last politician in America who could bring together rich and poor, who could talk to the whole nation, and had the moral outrage to challenge people in their complacency. And that excited me. And I remember going to bed and Robert Kennedy had won the primary, and it was clear he was going to win. All the projections said he was going to win. And my mother woke me up the next morning and said Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. It all fell apart. Everything had fallen apart. Um, I really believed. I really thought he was going to be the next president of the United States. And I can't ever remember a time of feeling less hopeful about the country or feeling sadder. It was as if a member of my immediate family had died. And I remember a day or two later, heading off to St. Patrick's Cathedral, where Robert Kennedy was lying in state. And I waited online, it was very cold. It was a June, it was still cold. And I remember I waited five, six hours just to walk past his coffin and talking to people in the crowd and hearing the crowd, the level of sadness, the horror, the lack of belief, 
that this could possibly be happening. I remember watching the funeral on TV. Robert Kennedy is still one of those figures who's very important in my life. No biography of Robert Kennedy comes out that I don't read. On, the, on my office wall, I have only two pictures that can be called at all political. Um, one is a collage of pictures of Robert Kennedy, and the other is an event in higher education history. Robert Kennedy, for me, is still very, very powerful as a leader. In those times in which I forget why I chose education as a career, I ask college students all around the country, optimistic or pessimistic about the future, will the United States be a better or worse place to live in the next 10 years? And the answer I've gotten back in the past is, well, I think the United States is probably a better place to live in the past than it is now, and I expect the next few years for it to be much worse. So I'd say, <clears throat> my God, you must be pessimistic about the future. And they'd say, no, I'm optimistic. And I'd say, how could that be? And the answer is, I have good grades, I'm going to get a good job, and I'm going to make a lot of money. What happened is, Today's students, or previous generation, recent students, have essentially adopted Titanic ethic. There's a sense the ship, and call that ship the US, or call it the world, is going down. And that as long as they're being forced to ride on the doomed ship, they're going to make the voyage as luxurious as possible and go first class.